Kelly, I am glad you're back because I, I looked at my calendar was like almost exactly a year ago we we recorded an episode. So for the people who have not listened to that episode, maybe maybe after you listen to this one, go back and get some of the backstory because we're we're not going to go too far back. But Kelly Smith is the founder of Prenda, which is a growing uh, network of micro schools uh, around the country. Is that a pretty good explanation, Kelly? Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to have you back on because you just wrote a book and it's something that I feel like everyone in this audience should hear and be thinking about and, and learning from because we always talk about these connected circles of of trying to break down the silos because at the end of the day, everyone cares about making the best opportunities for each kid. So that's that's my setup for you, Kelly. Now, now let's just talk. What's been going on in the last year? <laughs> Kevin, so good to be here. First of all, good to be back and uh, really appreciate the work you guys are doing and your audience. I mean, you have, it's, it's exciting to think about people out there and in schools and, and other kind of learning environments, thinking about how we can do this better for kids. I just, I think the world needs that and um, we owe it to the the next generation. So appreciate you and, and the work you guys are doing definitely want to talk about your book what what's the latest i know when we talked about a year ago prenda was yeah you know, working through and you know and i know you guys um kind of have some big growth initiatives and and trying to go into different states and kind of uh-huh. what where are you guys at right now what's yeah so great question um we're still in kind of our next wave of states but we've had some change even among which states uh part of that has to do with one of these macro shifts in the education landscape so um, I think for those of you who listened last time, but there, you'll remember I started a micro school in my house in 2018. We immediately felt like this needs to be available for free to all families. So we've been partnering with schools, doing some work inside of you know traditional elementary schools, but also um, you know as a, a partner to virtual schools, allowing you know students to be enrolled, and the, the funding comes from the state, so it's free to the families, and that's been an exciting. Kind of journey. Obviously, COVID blew things up for us, and we have all kinds of interests. It's macro shift number one. You know, we feel like we've been running on tectonic plates that continue to shift. Macro shift number two is is school choice policies in some of our key key markets. And I don't know those of you, you know, those of your audience listening to this, but the the ESA concept of just giving the funds directly to families and letting them uh, make decisions about where that's going to go. That's affected us. So we have people that have stepped in and said, okay, I want to create my own learning environment. I want to run my own micro school. And Prenda has adapted quickly to support those, those people while we continue to support our school partners as well. So uh, we're in the middle of, of both. What we've seen is a lot of energy and momentum coming from that, uh, you know, that, that place of these school choice policies. Yeah, well, Kelly, you and I are both in Arizona, so I know that happened here. We're seeing it kind of locally happening. Right. Are there other states that that had similar policies happen? Yeah, to? I think twenty states. So oh, you God. follow this. It's a it's a wave sweeping the nation. Arizona was first, but um, Florida passed a similar initiative. Arkansas, Utah, these are the ones that are coming on, you know, this year and next. But then there's a whole bunch that have uh, adapted some version of it. You know, whether it's um, you know, a, a limitation around income levels or around special needs, but uh, Indiana, Iowa, South Carolina, West Virginia, New Hampshire has a program. We're active there. So, uh, yeah, as you kind of watch the this trend, the shift in in education policy, uh, it's definitely playing. You know, having an impact in the way we just encounter educators and and families in our marketplace. That's really, and did you anticipate, did you see this coming and that was part of it? Or is this just, you're focused on what you need to do and then this kind of a wave kind of yeah, came edu- in and came into your world? <laughs> Education is interesting. It's it's always been uh, very, you know, highly charged uh, politically and there's lots of opinions and perspectives. Um, it also is a large budget item. So there's a lot of eyeballs on it and it's state by state. So there's a lot of reasons uh, in the U.S. not to bet on a a movement like this. Um, In fact, the whole time I've been doing this, I've thought, well, those policies would simplify things a lot because they would allow parents to be the ultimate arbiter of, you know, what should education be and what school do I want to choose? And if the parents have the funds, they can, uh, you know, make those decisions directly. And, um, and meanwhile, there's a lot of resistance to that. And I thought this isn't ever going to happen um, in Arizona or anywhere else. 
Um, and so I've been surprised by it, to be honest. We've seen a lot of a lot of energy, a lot of momentum around it, and families that are, you know, like for the first time in, in a lot of cases, they're exercising choice and they're able to look hard at what's right for their child, what environments. Sometimes that's something simple, like a homeschool s- situation, but increasingly it's not what they want is to do it alone at their house. They want to gather with other families and create a micro school experience. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to talk to you again, because it is, as I'm having these conversations for the podcast and at conferences around the country, um, there, there seems to be this like missing piece that, that this conversation might fill, because sure. if you talk to the school superintendents at the public districts, you'll hear um, there, there's a certain percentage of students that after COVID are just like considered quote unquote lost, lost yeah. like they, they just didn't come back. And, um, and, you know, and, and, you know, in a lot of ways, it's kind of speculation of where did they go? Did they go to online schools? Did they go to something like this or homeschooling or a micro school thing? And the answer is probably a combination of, of all of that, but, um, there's definitely people that understand what's going on in the micro school movement. I've been learning more and more about that, but I think in the broad general public probably has never even heard of this term of a micro school. Yeah. I think it's still new and it's uh, that, that carries with it. Obviously the disadvantages of you have to educate and help people understand what it is, but it also brings, um, I think a lot of positive. It's, it's exciting. It's a format that, you know, as I have a chance to talk to lots and lots, I mean, tens of thousands of families, educators, parents, um, you have these conversations. And as they realize what we're talking about here, uh, you'll hear one of two things. I wish I had that for, for my kids when they were young or me when I was a student, or you'll hear um, that's exactly what I, I've wanted to do as an educator all along. Right. So hmm. the the flexibility and the freedom to be able to put this together. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have have felt a little bit stuck in various, for various reasons inside of, you know, education structures. And I think what this does is instead of just complaining about it, which is what you had before, you could submit a complaint or write a letter to the school board or something. Now you can actually co-create, you can be part of the solution. And that's a really exciting proposition for a lot of, a lot of people. All right. I'm just going to bring it up because we have to address like what, <laughs> what other people are in there is what are, what are the objectives when you're getting kind of pushed back to this? Like, I'm just going to say the one that, that I would think pulls up is that if you're, if the money's following the kid, then it's taking money away from the public schools. Yeah. Um, what, I mean, what, what's kind that's, of the view on that? That's a huge one. I mean, it's definitely a, a question, a conversation. What these policymakers have done, I think really well is they've set the, the dollar value lower than what schools use to educate kids. So a world, let's say there's some extreme world, and I don't think this is ever going to be the case, but some extreme world where everyone does it this way instead of the old way, well, you've got a built-in, you know, 20 or 25% cost savings because they're getting less money per per student than what um, than what happens in other places. But that's not all, right? I think there's a sense of, well, we've built these systems and structures. And I think the question is, uh, and these are hard questions, I think have to be asked, what is the point, right? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, is the goal to have, you know, government operated systems and buildings? You know, I think most people would would back up and say, well, no, I think the reason has to do something with, with students, with kids. If that's the goal, then I think we have, we have an opportunity to have a reasonable discussion about what are the best ways to do that? How should we ap- approach that problem? Um, that's not where everybody's coming from on this, right? And it's, it's, we've put a lot of work, a lot of time, there's a lot of money kind of invested in kind of the status quo and the way things are. And so, you know, I, I think part of that, that debate just comes from, and this is often unspoken, but, you know, what are the goals, right? Is the goal here, um, you know, specifically around unlocking, unleashing, empowering kids as lifelong learners that are going to take off and do things? Um, I think when that's the, the question, I think it, it really is productive. It's a great way to frame the conversation. And I've been having a lot of these discussions too. And I'm always trying to take like the, like I always, the, the term I've been using a lot is this radically student centered approach. And, Absolutely. and really that center is because I, I just can't stand politics and I don't want to go anywhere, <laughs> the left or the right, right. But recognize that that's a reality. Like a, a yeah. lot of the policy that's coming is political. 
But if we really just look at what's the best thing for a student, it's it, for each student, we know that every student learns differently. And I, as we're kind of observing, like if I'm just going to kind of like lift up and be like, all right, what's going on in this country? Uh -huh. it, it feels like it's just going to continue to get more fragmented, just like the rest of the economy and like the, the country right now. It's just like our media consumption is very fragmented, like our shopping, like our shopping preferences are just becoming more and more fragmented where, you know, in the past it would be like, you know, just as media is the example, you'd have your three major networks and everyone watched one of those, or, you know, a combination of those three. Now you're looking at, there's like hundreds and thousands of different outlets. And I feel like that's a pretty good um, indicator of what is going to continue to happen in education is there's probably gonna be a lot more fragmentation like this. And I know we're here to kind of talk about the book. I, I would just say, <laughs> as you think, as you think about that, right? Um, I think there's an implicit assumption in some of these debates, and it bothers me from the right or left, which is, what do we want to teach these kids to think? What are we going to tell them about such and such popular theory or such and such, you know? And and every student should learn this, and we need to make this mandatory. And you can fill in the blank. It's different depending on which political orientation or worldview you have. But part of what I'm pushing back on is saying, look, we need a generation of people who's capable of thinking and engaging and, and participating in a dialogue. So what, what to me that means is really building a system. And we can do this through, through nudges and through design choices in the system. You know, you, you have uh, folks in your audience that are experts at learning environments. The, you know, when you're setting up a physical space, you're having a huge impact on the way kids learn, but it's not direct. You're not there with them. You're not in the room. Like somehow the choices that you make are, are shaping things. And, and likewise, when we put this together, uh, we've, we've put a strong resistance into Prenda's model uh, really around like trying to prevent indoctrination of any sort, right? It's here's uh, here are topics. The, the teacher's not leading it. The students are leading it. And then a healthy, a, a format for healthy debate, discussion, a way to kind of engage with each other, look at different perspectives. And so you put that together and, you, and then you create, combine that with a small group where there's a lot of psychological safety and students are able to open up and ask a question and not worry about getting a bad grade or looking dumb in front of their friends. And you put this together. I really see this type of learning as being the antidote to some of the, the darker negative sides of what we're seeing in the world uh, at large. And that's a perfect segue into the book here because thanks for thanks for going there with me. Not everyone's <laughs> willing to go there with me, but but when you look at the book, the fact that you are like writing this and putting it out to the public, it, it doesn't mean that public, you know, public school districts can't take this. Private school, anyone can't take some of these things and and integrate it into the way that you know like they're delivering their education. So it's. Let, let's talk about it. So title of the book, a, a fire to be kindled. I want to, I want to get the backstory of how you came with that title, but I don't know if there is like, if you want to start out, there's any story of what prompted, like why, why the book? Why now? No, we debated. I mean, what, what should you call a book? That's really trying to uh, like posit a, an alternate type of future for humanity. I mean, this is as lofty as it gets as audacious as it gets. I mean, I'm saying I'm long on humans so much that I believe we can solve cancer and pandemics and, you know, uh, environmental challenges and political unrest and social problems. These are all solvable problems and our generation can do it, but not if all we do is meet the minimum and kind of jump through hurdles and, and sort of phone it in. And, and I say that as somebody who phoned it in all the way through school, you know, I was, I was good at it, but I was not uh, stretching myself to my actual potential as a learner. I wasn't the type of person that was going to go out and make any sort of measurable difference or impact in the world at, at age 18. I mean, you could have met me. I, uh, if you met me then you would say, here's a smart Alec who is pretty good at sort of getting what he wants. And, uh, and I was, you know, looking back, I, I feel a little ashamed, but it's a little manipulative. I mean, maybe wasn't honest, at least not honest with myself. Right. I, I, I bragged about getting, you know, no grade over 91%, but I had all A's through high school. So I was always riding that line exactly as I could. And I was proud of that. And look back, it's like, man, what if I had really cared about learning 
sort of identified what I was passionate about, what I cared about, and then invested, like really invested myself in building those skills and abilities. What, like, what could that have looked like for me? And I've thankfully found that as an adult, I've gone back and sort of rewired myself as a learner. But, you know, I think too many of us, it's too easy to sort of slip into a passive mode. So you asked about the title. The title of the book is A Fire to be Kindled. This is a reference to Plutarch. This is 2000 years ago. Plutarch was a Greek Roman philosopher. He says, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. We talk about these two analogies. The vessel to be filled is really comforting for educators. We sort of hold a, you know, if you imagine each child is like a little cup and you just need to pour the standards in there and, and then check the test. And it's a, it's a controlled environment. It's something that has a lot of predictability versus, and this is what I, I think Plutarch's right, you guys, is, is it's really a fire. It's, it's spontaneous. There's chaos to it. It's about getting the conditions right. And the fire happens and it's, it's magical, but it's not going to happen especially if you're sitting there pouring water on it, you know? So it really is a kind of a paradigm in the way you think about human learning that I think is incredibly powerful. I think we've by and large missed it. Most of us have too passive a mode uh, when it comes to ourselves as learners. And when we think about helping another person as a learner, I think we've got a lot of improvement that could unlock and, and open up new possibilities for individuals and for all of, all of society. Well, let's talk about some of those philosophies. I know in there you got the you have the five core values that are kind of integrated throughout the book. The uh, the the core values that really it sounds like Prenda is kind of based yeah. on. Do you want to kind of talk through those? I, I mean, sure. the first one is is dare greatly. What what does that mean yeah. in I mean, in the... Prenda world and and how did you kind of <laughs> come up with that? Question number one in, in all of this is why right to be an empowered learner to be somebody whose fire is kindled you have to make a choice. You have to make a decision to learn something. And for too many of us, I think this gets back to the passive thing. It's like the choice is made for you. You're here because you have to, the law requires it. My mom's making me, I don't want to be here, but I have to. It's like any of those framings, you could still get some stuff done maybe, but it's like against your will, you know, versus, I mean, and think about this. You can see this every day with children who get excited about like solving a, a level in a video game or uh, my daughter literally right now is taking apart a sewing machine, trying to figure out how to put it, you know, fix a problem with it. She, you know, she's sticking with the problem for a long time. She's taking repeated attempts and failing over and over again. She's consuming resources, watching YouTube videos, looking at stuff. That's learning, right? That's what we want. But in order for that to happen, you need a goal. You, have, you need a reason. Why am I doing this? So Dear Greatly is so much about just setting a big goal for yourself something that scares you a little bit, something that's out there. You don't even know exactly how you're going to do it, but it's a reason for you to take those, those steps. And then the next value kind of going right into it is we call figure it out. That's the resourcefulness of day to day. Some of the behaviors my daughter is literally doing, it's the things I do as a business owner. It's the things that, I mean, really anything you're trying to learn, you're trying, failing, repeat, <laughs> you're asking a lot of questions, you're getting help anywhere you can. And so it really is about that that scrappiness, that uh, persistence, and there's all kinds of yeah, that, that yeah, grit that that grit, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that's where you were talking about. Um, I'll bring back Mark Rober too because I'm a big fan, and I know you sure. had you had a section in there where where you teamed up with Mark Rober on yeah. on a project. You want to give a little bit of context <laughs> of what that was about? Yeah, I I happen to know Mark from from college, so we've been friends for a long time uh, before you know any of his YouTube stuff started. Uh, really an in incredible example of all of this. I mean, he is an empowered learner in the most extreme way. Um, we were talking about it and he said, what, what would be like an interesting sort of education angle on this? And, and part of what I wanted people to know was, um, was how powerful a growth mindset really can be, right? So um, we did an experiment. We got a behavioral economist, one of our other friends, Ty, and my friend Andy is a software developer. We put together a little coding puzzle and we sent it out to Mark's subscribers. It was like 50,000 people took this test. And the way that the puzzle worked is um, you had to use blocks of code clicked together in the right order to navigate a maze. There's a right answer. There's a way to do it um, where your car will successfully navigate the maze. And then there's a, you know, optimal, the, the best uh, way to do it. Right. And so you put this together and people came and tried it. And most of them missed on the first try. And a lot of people, you know, would quit after one or two tries. 
uh, and other people would stay and they would keep going and it'd get to this point and it would say turn left, but it should have been right. So they go fix the code and then they push and we could keep track of how many times they clicked the, the run button, right? Because that's that's their test. So we're watching this, um, we're watching this unfold for 50,000 people. And what, what came back with statistical significance on these data sets is, um, is that the people who really stuck with it, right? These people that would, would continue, they would get it, they would figure it out. And, and the average number of attempts was large. It was like seven, you know? So if somebody quits after two, it's, you're not going to do it. And the thing we wanted to see was, can you actually encourage somebody to, um, to check more attempts, to keep going, to try and um, what we found is that you can vary the messaging, the way you talk to them about it. I think schools have done a remarkable job over the last even just five, 10 years of incorporating growth mindset language, right? Like power of yet, you can do this, keep trying. Um, that, that has some impact. But the thing that had even more impact was the structure of the game, right? The, the way that it works. If you're penalized for a wrong answer, even if you're, pe- you're given a positive message, but there's a penalty for the wrong answer, Um, you're going to quit. And we saw that statistically. So part of what we were saying is, as we think about this, as designers of educational systems, let's take away things that that penalize the wrong answer, right? Like a a time-based unit is a great example of this. We're going to study this topic of math for the next six weeks. Uh, At the end of that unit, we're going to give you a test and whatever number you or letter you got on that test goes into the record and it really nothing you can do about it. Yeah. From and then you're done. Just forget about it. Just move so, on. After yeah. That. I mean, yeah. so it doesn't matter at that point if there's a growth mindset poster on the wall, right? It's, it's really about, you know, I, I got the message, which is I needed to, to get the A by that day and I'm going to do whatever it takes, you know, to, to get that A, whether or not that means learning anything. Right. And, and so it kind of puts, at, puts us at odds with our actual goals sometimes the way we design things. That's really cool. Yeah. So that experiment showed that if they're encouraged to do it more, they're, they're more often going to yeah, complete can, and figure out it. the right thing. And, yeah. and Sal Khan talks about this too. This is a, this is a variable, the, the growth mindset that you can actually impact. You can change for people. You can do it by talking to them about it, but even more important, you can do it by designing the rules of the system that they're playing. So very um, cool. And that's why, by the way, you know, when Prenda's system for micro schools, it's mastery based, right? We, we tell the kids, look, I don't care if this takes you two weeks or two minutes, like you keep doing this topic until you've learned it and then move on to the next topic. So you can build for mastery um, as opposed to, you know, just keep doing worksheets. We'll be done with this unit in three weeks, whether you understand it or not. Um, the third core value is, is learning over comfort. This is where we just really explicitly acknowledge that it's not going to be comfortable, right? This road of, of being an empowered learner. Um, if I'm, if I'm comfortable, just like, you know, at the gym, right. I could go and just sit there comfortably at the gym, but it's in the discomfort that the growth is happening. And this is true for our brains as well. Um, we say this to children all the time. It's fascinating to see them kind of grapple with this and make this decision like, okay, Like it's not going to be comfortable, but I choose learning. I choose learning over comfort. So uh, that's one. And then the other two core values are are really driven by this insight that learning is not a fully individualistic thing, right? It it matters a lot, our our individual agency and and the decisions we make, but we're always around other people. We're connected to them. Uh, And so our, our final two core values start with heart and foundation of trust have to do with how do we see and look at the, the people around us? There's so much to learn with and from and through others. Uh, that's in our modern, you know, connected world. That's most learning actually is, is with people. And so it's about framing, you know, how do we interact and, and really pushing deep. It's how do you see another human being? Um, can you see them as a, as a human being with, with unlimited potential, with infinite value? Um, if you're looking at them in any other way, and this is really useful for you know, a classroom teacher or an educator, an adult trying to help children, kids have these amazingly sensitive detectors. They know if you are dismissive of them, they know if you've labeled them, they know if you see them as a nuisance or an obstacle or annoying, they can tell, I mean, intuitively they know 
if you're complaining about them in the teacher's lounge. And so what we're trying to say here is um, let's ask ourselves that question. Like, can we get to a point where we really acknowledge that humanity in, in others and design around it? Right. Like in our case, uh, opening a micro school with 10 kids, that's the first thing we're looking for is can you be that, that adult for 10 people? It doesn't mean we're perfect, right? We're going to have days where we want to, <laughs> you know, you get a little frustrated and you want to just go in the backyard and scream, but, um, but to shoot for that, to have that out there as an ideal. And then on, on the flip side, the foundation of trust is the perception of that in others, right? If I see other people as, um, objectifying me or manipulating me in any way, there's a very strong human response in the opposite direction. I think it's undermining a lot of our attempts and efforts to educate kids. So what, what I'm saying in that chapter is, um, you know, let's be explicit about that. If trust isn't there, let's build trust. And um, and that's hard work. It's messy work. It's not like some sort of easy shortcut that I can give you, unfortunately, but it's worth it. It's valuable. And it's the way that you create uh, actual safety and, and risk taking that will lead to real learning. Yeah. And those last two remind me of situations. Um, one, like even with my own kids, um, there's always the discussion, you know, after school about something. And there's one of my kids in particular, it's either like the teacher likes me or doesn't like me. Uh-huh. And, and they pick up on it, whatever it is, you're like, oh, they, they don't like me. And, <laughs> and how that foundation just cracks then. Like if, yeah. if that's his perception, then he can't like get over <laughs> it in there um but then there's the other side of it that i feel like is a discussion a lot in these conferences that i go to and in conversations where we're even getting into like like um you know just the mental health of students and the depression rates and kind of like the worst case scenario types of things and there's a lot of discussion of like the kids just need to know that there's at least one person in that building that cares about them and, and I think that's, you know, like obviously having a smaller group, you know, it, it, it fosters that a lot easier than, you know, than it would in a big building where their primary teacher, you know, like they don't have that, that relationship. It's really hard for them to do that. So it's always important. And that's kind of the discussion we always have. It doesn't matter if it's a janitor, it doesn't matter like who it is in there. There's gotta be at least one person that, that a kid feels like they can trust and they can connect with. One caring adult. Absolutely. Um, the numbers, I don't remember if I put this in the book, but in the research for this, just looking that up, um, you know, you'll get a very different answer if you ask the adults versus the kids. Right. And so they asked the kids, I think a whole large sample of kids in California high schools, you know, name the adult that cares about you in your daily life. And it was really heartbreaking. I think something like a full third of them, uh, could not, could not name a single adult. So um, you know, whether they're right or not, it'd be easy to sit there as their teacher and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. I do. Right. But, um, but I think really trying to deliberately build that type of, that type of trust. And I include some stories in the book of, you know, really sometimes obnoxious behavior, kids just disrupting others, giving up, not putting any effort in. And, uh, upon further investigation, there was a sense that, um, they just didn't want to, they didn't want to open themselves up to hurt, right. And, and failure. Um, so it's complicated. Humans are complicated. I think what we're trying to do is, is get to a place where if they believe that we have their best interest at heart, really believe that we know them, we talk to them, we understand each other. They, they know how we feel about them. Uh, that kids will, I can't say always, but I've seen it now thousands of times in almost every case, they will kind of set that psychological armor aside and say, look, the reason I, <laughs> the reason I'm acting this way, maybe they won't say it in these words, they're a second grader, but is I'm struggling with these concepts and I'm embarrassed about it. I'm, I'm acting out because I don't want others to think of me as a failure. Uh, I'm challenging your authority because you know, whatever I like, I don't, I want, I want others to think of me a different way. And so so much of it has to do with, and this is, you know, channeling Brene Brown. I think I quote her a lot in this chapter, but just, just getting to this place where you can be, you know, you can actually be your vulnerable, awesome self, but that's, that's required. That's a prerequisite for real learning. Yeah, for sure. When, 
do you mind kind of talking a little bit what what it actually looks like like when you're talking about having six to ten kids and kind of a yeah. uh and what's the term you knew it's not facilitator is it like what what do you call it the guide yeah um what what does that look like like is there a sweet spot age group are they you know like is it important that they're all like within the certain age or are you trying to spread it out like what yeah. like what what is it, what does that look like where you've seen like the best case scenario this um, is a place where um to be honest i didn't really know I, there's all this research about mixed age classrooms and people came to me and said, I really want to mix it up. Um, we had some people that say, I want K through eight all in my, in one micro school. So sibling pairs and spreading, spanning across all the ages. Uh, there's people that have done it that way. There's others that are like, no, you know, I want my child to know other people their same year. My daughter was in a micro school with 10 girls, her same, her same grade, you know, her same age. So, um, so it's a different, a different way. I actually don't believe there's a single answer to this. I think it depends on kids and the parents and the guide. Um, but what we do see is a need for there to be an environment, right? Where instead of just kind of trying to hide or disappear or challenge everything, where the students have an opportunity to make a choice, right? To make a decision, to opt in. Like I'm here, I'm part of this group. I feel accountability to my peers, to my friends. Um, You know, so in the case of a single age and single gender group, it's like, it's like a team, like we're all in this together. In fact, literally this group of girls did a robotics competition and they went and, you know, won some medals at the state and things like that. But in a case where it's the older kids and the younger kids, there's also a sense of being really invested, right? The older kids walk, sitting down and patiently helping a younger child learn to read. Like you're part of their story now in a way that really opens you up and, and encourages you to be, uh, you know, all fully in as a, as a learner, instead of just, you know, I think it's, it's too easy in a larger setting and a kind of an overly structured system to just kind of, kind of try to skirt through, right. Keep your head down. (laughs) Don't, uh, don't do anything. And, and, um, hopefully no one will notice that your fire is not, not lit. Right. So what I love about the small environments and, and by the way, I think this can happen, like you said earlier, in lots of environments, but I like the small environments easier to kind of see whose fire is lit. Are they really invested? Are they doing, and it's going to look different for every human. So are they doing those things that are an empowered learner does? Yeah. And, and that totally makes sense. That would be different for every learner, but are you seeing enough like trends here where you're like, where you're like preparing the the parents to be like, Hey, they're, they're going to struggle with this at first, but there's going to be like a moment where it clicks and, and they're going to want to go like, like, do you see like certain, like, yeah. Um, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I got to think, I mean, that first day they're, yeah. you know, it's like anywhere else. Like, it's not like they're immediately going to have trust and feel like, yeah, like I, I can go and, you know, and take that growth mindset. There's got to, yeah, it, it's got to be fostered. <laughs> I would say one of them is um, we have what's what we call create mode. Every day, the kids spend some time in small groups, typically pairs. They'll work with a partner and work on something. And they, um, you know, they'll choose something. Often at the beginning of the year, the whole class chooses something together. We're going to all do this project. We're going to work on it. And it feels kind of like an assignment, right? Like a homework assignment or a group project, because they're used to that from a past, a past school they've gone to. And and so it's interesting to watch. There'll be kind of that first assignment. They'll do the work. They'll turn it in. They, you know, present about it. But there's a sense of, um, I don't want to say, it's not, it's just not like fire, right? You can tell by sitting there. It's like, I did this because I had to, you told me to, and here's my, here's my work. Uh, and then you compare and contrast that typically as, as time goes on and kids are getting more and more kind of agency in this, getting to choose the project they want to work on find say a partner that is is invested in the same learning the same thing that you're learning and somebody just goes really really deep on something and and you can tell they're just so passionate i was out in a small town in eastern arizona recently and these two girls had built a a working replica of the human digestive system so it had like a, a bunch of pipes and tubes and this green liquid like flowing through it and they didn't have to do that they could have easily just printed a picture off the internet and put it on their poster. But that was because they, they were into it, right? They wanted to, um, it wasn't for a grade. I don't think it was even graded. They just 
when they were going to show their work, they wanted to understand it. They wanted to help others understand it and actually see. And you could talk to them about, well, what did you learn? And they've got all this interesting stuff they picked up about what the small intestine does versus the large intestine. And it's like, that's learning, you know, that's, uh, that's because they chose to do it. So dare greatly, they had a purpose and then, and then they figured it out. They did the day to day, you know, step-by-step kind of grind and it is grind, right? It's like this information doesn't just appear in your head, but when you, when you've made a decision that you want it, you want to learn this, you want to master it. You know, it doesn't feel like work as much. It's a, it's just, it's an interesting phenomenon. And and so we, we try to see that. Um, I know it doesn't really give you the, you know, it's hard to quantify that. I don't know if I could tell you like overall, it takes this much time. I've seen kids go six months resisting and then have a breakthrough. I've seen other kids kind of pick it up really quickly. Yeah. And, and at the core of it is that it's a mix. So you, there is like an online curriculum piece of it. And then there's kind of this project-based learning component to yeah, it as well. So the group, I mean, basically the structure is an in-person. It, it looks like school for the, from the parents' perspective and the, the kids' perspective. It's like, we're going here. This is school. But part of the day is spent in what we call conquer mode, which is, you know, like I mentioned, instead of a teacher teaching a lesson and then a quiz at the end, it's students working right at their learning frontier. So the, you know, they're, they're in some sort of, sort of software, typically it's adapting to the mastery level of the student. They're answering questions all the time. They're collecting new information where they don't have it. So they might, you know, go like watch a video lecture about something or uh, read through a tutorial or go, you know, ask a peer in their class that understands things. We have live uh, math tutoring. So if I'm stuck on this and I can't do it, I'll just click a button and I've got this expert teacher that's walking me through, helping me find what do I not understand. So it's it, the, the difference is the students in the driver's seat, right? Like I'm in charge of my learning. All those resources are there, but they're not going to do learning to you. They're not going to try to pour water into your cup. Like you're the fire to be kindled, right? So, hmm. so the, the resources are there, like the conditions are right for learning, but ultimately, you know, it's up to you. And what you see there similarly is kids getting to this point where it's like, okay, what's the minimum? What do I have to do? One of the numbers we measure is uh, kids will have a recommended minimum goal every day in the software. We can see this. And it's like this recommended goal will get you through one grade level's worth of content in a year for math or English. And what we watch is, well, how often do kids go above that? Right. Cause they don't have to, no one's making them. That's an, an example to us of a child choosing to be a learner, right? Do they set goals? And what we find is a large percentage of our kids are setting, setting goals that are above and beyond, whether that's, you know, I came in behind and I want to catch up, or I came in on grade level, I want to get ahead. They're setting these ambitious goals and they don't hit their goals. It's interesting. We look, we watch and they, they miss, but where they land is stronger than, than if they had just kind of gone with the floor. So it's this I think very intuitive feel for those of us as adults who have set big goals and tried things, you know, kids are doing that at age five and 10 and, and 12 and 14. So it's been cool. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you going through all this and for people who do, uh, who want to read the book, who are curious if this sparked some kindled something for them um, to, to, to do that. What, what's What's the best way? I mean, we'll definitely have the link for the book. It would, yeah. Is that where you'd recommend? It's just be like, Please go through do. the book and, and try to... The book. Start I hope it's it. valuable for you. Um, Printer.com, of course, has all the information about the company. But um, but yeah, if you just... We can put the link, give you the link. So you can go straight to the book and hopefully it's useful. Yeah. All right. To the listeners, if you've not already subscribed, hit subscribe wherever you're at. Um, I feel like I can talk to Kelly more. And I, in fact, I probably will after after I do a little wrap up here. Um, but um, we also have a survey on betterlearningpodcast.com. If you can go ahead and fill out that survey, because there's one thing listening to this, but you're also going to hear kind of baked into this conversation. We want We want to kind of foster some action here. So there's a survey that you can take in there that kind of just is trying to figure out aligning with your gifts and your talents and where you want to help. So if you can go through that and, and take that, that, that would be uh, one of the best first steps you can take. We also will have the link here for Prenda and Kelly's book. 
Um, but Kelly, really appreciate your time. Um, we'll have to make this like a, a yearly thing here where we check in and see what the progress is. So we always talk about kind of this R and D, this natural R and D that happens within education around the country. And yeah. that's why, like, I think it's so important. Like if, if somebody has this idea, well, they may not know that somebody else has already solved it or has been working on it for five years. So that's, that's a lot of things we want to be doing with the show. So absolutely. Thanks, Kevin. The views and opinions expressed on the Better Learning Podcast are those of myself as an individual and my guests and do not necessarily represent the organizations that we work for, the Association for Learning Environments, K-12, Education Leaders Organization, or Second Class Foundation. 